So just to recap very quickly, the latest question was the question of um, what is the ultimate type of prayer? That, I think, is the question. Is the ultimate type of prayer prayer in which we have both intention and action, or both intention and verbalization? Or is prayer just good enough if we just verbalize the words without any intention? Sometimes that's how we pray, in a very robotic way. So does that count, or does that not count? Or we could even say the opposite way. What if I have good intention, but I don't verbalize the word? Is that prayer? Or not. And that's really what we're dealing with now in the last page or so. Of course, the ultimate type of prayer in which the two are combined, uh, both intention and verbalization. Now, just to start off by saying that verbalization does count, even without intention. Why? Because we are actually saying holy words. By saying holy words, we create energy around us. The words that we say, whether it's words of prayer or just words of the baseball scores of last night, well, we're not in baseball season, are we yet? No, of the, the basketball scores of last night, then they create some type of energy, some type of, of, of frequency around us. So the verbalization of prayer is very important. That's why also the Talmud says that uh, one must always say the words, um, and by saying the words, we are connecting our world, not just ourselves, to God. Why are we connecting our world, our world to God? Because the words are going around us, right? The words that we say are being heard now in this room. Now, by filling the words of the, this room with the words of God, then we're connecting this room to God himself. So that's really the deeper idea of verbalizing. And that's why also we have to be very careful with our words. Because if we say positive words, we create positive energies and of course, then we fill this world with godliness and with goodness. If we do the opposite, God forbid, then we divorce this world from God and we fill this world with negativity. So that's that's why verbalization counts with intention or without intention. Yes, the ultimate prayer is with intention, as we're about to say. But even if we don't have the intention, one should verbalize those words. Now, um, there is another advantage to verbalizing those words because the goal of any mitzvah is not just to do the mitzvah, but it's to do the mitzvah with consistency, right? When I do a good deed once, fine. A good deed was performed, and that's good. But if I do that good deed repetitively, then that creates change, right? It's like the great story of Rabbi Akiva, who at the age of 40 was a completely ignorant shepherd. You may know the story. And then he decided to completely change his life. How so? One day he was shepherding his sheep, and he, see, he sees that there's a drop of water falling on the same spot of the rock time and time again. And he looks at the rock and he sees that there's a hole in the rock. And he realizes, gosh, that this drop of water, this water, the stream of water dropping on the rock for so many days or weeks or months or years actually created a, rock, a hole in the rock. And he said to himself, well, if water can create a hole in the rock, so too the words of God, which are compared to water, can create a hole in my rock. My heart is like a rock now, but with that repetitiveness, that consistency, then the rock will be penetrated. And he decided from that day on to go and study Torah. And he studied Torah not for one year, not for two years, for 24 years. And after 24 years, he became the greatest scholar of Judaism. He came back to his town with thousands of followers but and students. But that's the idea, really. The repetitiveness of the water dripping on the same spot creates a hole in the rock. And therefore, as Rabbi Steinzels put it, even if we don't feel it, even if the intention, intention is not there, we should still continue to, to pray because the verbalization of prayer itself is what creates that, that consistency. Not only does it add, again, godliness and positivity to the rooms that we're in, but it also creates a true shift of direction until our rock, our inner rocks maybe um, are, are penetrated. So that's, that's, those are the two advantages of verbalizing prayer even without intention. But he continues to speak about how intention is so important and how it can really create other types of, of magics, so to speak. So let's continue here at the bottom of page 134 with uh, the line that, that begins with, right? That's where we're up to. Thus, when the Talmudic sage, does anyone want to read? Please, Gila, Bechavot, go for it. Yeah. 
Okay. 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 Yeah, we are transitioning to yet another big idea, and that is that really the goal of life altogether, and it's reflected very strongly in prayer, is to be completely aligned, right? As, as one of the uh, Rabbi Levitz Kagaberdichev would say, would say that our mind needs to be aligned with our heart, our heart needs to be aligned with our actions. That's when we're completely aligned. Now, sometimes we're not aligned, and when we're not aligned, then our mind doesn't necessarily reflect what's on the heart and our heart doesn't necessarily reflect what's in our actions and vice versa. And therefore, we find that there's this sort of dichotomy within ourselves. This dichotomy was expressed in the prayer of Rabbi Hanina ben Dosa when his words were stuttering words. When he knew that he was stuttering in prayer, he knew that this was a reflection of his non-alignment. And therefore, the godliness that he hoped would flow in his prayer did not exist since he was not aligned. So the godliness that flows gets stuck somewhere in the middle or has a hard time really coming out in an aligned way. That's how he knew that uh, whether his prayer was a good prayer and therefore accepted or not. Uh, he tells the story, right, of even in Talmud of praying for the sick and stuttering and he knew that the, the sick person will not not be healed thanks to his prayer, maybe thanks to other things, because again, he was stuttering. But Gila, you wanted to say something. <laughs> yeah. A little bit about it. A um, couple of things. One is, he knew the prayer had been accepted. Mm -hmm. um, right. And secondly, when a person has motivation, that's good, and they want to do the right thing, I thought the show was in the degree and help somewhere in that stuttering process that he was not there. And then God said, it doesn't matter. You're the one. You're okay. You can be the Jewish people. Right. That's a good question. So, uh, well, Rabbi Hanim Mendoza was really one, was one of those saints. There are many, many stories about him and uh, uh, miracles that he performed. Uh, in fact, his generation said that the whole world exists uh because thanks to Rabbi Hanina Mendoza, thanks to him and his merits, uh, he was a man of tremendous piousness, very, he lived in terrible poverty. Uh, yet, um, whenever he wanted to give tzedakah, he would produce money miraculously for, for the poor. Uh, there's a great story about him that, I'm, I'm going to answer your question, a story that comes to mind of how um, he wanted to offer a good offering to the temple. He lived in, during the times of the second temple, but he had no money, not even money for a poor man's offering, which was flour. So he decided to bring a rock to the table, to the temple. Uh, but he wanted it to be a nice rock. So he carved it. He worked really hard on it to carve a beautiful rock for the temple. After he finished carving, he realized that he wasn't able to carry it. It was too heavy. And then all of a sudden, he sees four different people coming. And he says to them, hey, hey, hey. Please help me carry this rock and I'll pay you. You don't have the money, but I'll pay you. When we get to the temple, I'll pay you. They say to him, no problem. All you have to do, though, is at least help us with one finger. Hold this rock, even with just one finger. So you have these four people, Rabbi Hanina Mendoza, pushing this rock upwards with just one finger, carrying this rock to the temple. They drop it off. He tells them to drop it off. And then he looks for them to pay them. They disappeared completely disappeared. <laughs> and he was uh, sure that these were angels who had come to help him offer this beautiful offering to God because God wants the heart. And he, of course, did it with his heart. And that's what really helped uh, Rabbi Hanina Vendosa also carry this rock thereafter. Mm -hmm. By the way, this idea of adding, just add your finger is this general idea that God will give us blessings, but we have to participate in them. Mm -hmm. We have to do our best, as they say, and God will do the rest. So we still have to put that finger in. But that that was Rabbi Hanina Badosa. So he, that's the way his life functioned. But just to go back to your answer, and then I'll take your question, Haiti. But so so uh, how, how did he know? And uh, we can contrast that with Mo Moshe, who was Moses, right? Who, who started. So 
I think it it's it's that level of the righteous that that is completely um, filled with godliness to the point that the righteous in that level don't even exist. They are there just as conduits of God. They have nothing, nothing in it for themselves. There's no ego. There's no existence of a separate human being in that level. It's just God. And they are there to serve as God's conduit for the world. That's what that level is all about. That's what the righteous are all about. Now, <clears throat> when you serve as that ultimate conduit, you also know how God is going to be carrying himself through you. Sometimes it's through your words. Sometimes it's through your actions. Rabbi Hanina Mendoza had a way with words. So he knew that God's energy was going to flow through his words, and therefore he also knew when he started. Moses was more through his actions. So that was his conduit to this world. So it depends on what type of righteous person you are, but the common denominator between all of them is that you are conduits. You know, another story comes to mind, I don't know if I've sh ever shared this with you, but really that that is what a righteous person is all about. But I'm sure you've all heard of Arik Sharon, who was the prime minister of Israel. He was also a general in the Israeli army. Uh, he led also the paratrooper unit. Um, and um, in 1977, he came for a business trip to speak to some of his colleagues in Washington, D.C. He was a general in the, in the Israeli army then. And everyone told him, you should go and get a blessing from the late Lubavitcher Rebbe. So he planned his trip so that uh, this would be his last meeting. This blessing or this meeting with the Lubavitcher Rebbe would be his very last item before he goes back to Israel. So he planned it so that from the Rebbe's office, he would then travel to JFK. And from JFK, he would go back to Israel. So he's there sitting in the Rebbe's office. And he keeps looking at his watch because he doesn't want to miss his flight. And the Rebbe says to him, why are you looking at your watch? He says, because I have a flight to catch. That's the way I plan my trip. The Rebbe says to him, you have a flight to catch? He said, we need to talk. You'll just catch the next flight. Lo and behold, he misses his flight. The Rebbe wanted to talk. So he couldn't say no. The flight that he missed was hijacked by Algerian terrorists. On the next trip to New York, he went back to the rabbi and he said, thank you for saving my life. But I have a complaint to file. Why? Because if you knew that this plane was going to be hijacked, why didn't you save all the passengers? Why don't you just call JFK and tell them, hey, there's terrorists on this plane? And the rabbi told him, you really think I knew? When I told you to stay, those were the words that God put in my mouth. Now, in a way, that's the ultimate tzaddik, righteous person, that he's so in tune, he's so aligned, that his words are God's words. He doesn't necessarily know what he's saying, but we know that his words are divine, are prophetic, and he, because he or she is a conduit to God. And in a way, that's what Rabbi Hanina Mendoza was alluding to. I know whether my words are, are, are God's words if they are flowing like this, like they flowed for the Rebbe with Arik Sharon. If they are not flowing, if there's an obstruction, then I guess that maybe they might be God's words, but they're not going to be as effective as, as the other types of words. Yeah. Hedy, you want to say I something? Just, um, I, I, thought, I wondered how the Bikah Hong comes in to this. I think that's the, the absolute... Bikah Hong, you mean trust in God? How does that fit in with... Well, with, uh, not, with, not with the art wrong, but with the other... It fits in maybe in, in the way we can refine ourselves to be conduits. So how do you reach that level? How do you reach the level of a tzaddik? I couldn't tell you accurately because I'm not at that level, but I can tell you what it says in those books. How do you reach that level? You reach that level by aligning yourself with God as much as you can throughout the day and throughout the night one of the tools to align yourself with God is trust, is bitachon, is having trust in God that you might not know where this is going, what that is going, but you trust in God that this is what he wants to, you to do, and therefore you are doing it. And then God says, okay, I'll align myself with you. You've aligned myself, yourself with me. I'll align myself with you. That comes with a lot of bitachon, with a lot of trust. 
Of course, it comes with, as we said, repetitiveness, consistency. It comes also with uh, asking the question of where I am, not who I am. Everyone asks the question of who I am today. Who am I? Who am I? And they define themselves in all sorts of ways. We're not going to go into politics, but I'm this, I'm that. You can be anything today. And everyone who asks is obsessed with the question of who I am. But in the Torah, that question is not asked. The only question asked of man is, where are you? Ayeka, where are you? Why? Where are you versus the surroundings? What are you doing to impact your surroundings? That's that's the ultimate question. One of the great, yes. Just curious. You hear we talk, we help. We, 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 yeah, yeah. speaking God's words to them. Instead of your mind playing something else and there's something else going on and I've got to go here and I've got to go there. Do you yourself ever feel like a feeling of like such a great connection? Yeah. Speaking God's words. Absolutely. Absolutely. There's no doubt. I think I think I don't know how you get there. I think God leads you there. So you don't always know. But I think one of the ways that God can lead you there is by giving your all to be God's conduit, to do what you need to do for God in this world. By giving you all to becoming his agent of, of goodness to this world. And then once you do everything that you can, in whatever capacity that you can, some people are good at writing, so they do it in writing. Some people are good in, in kindness and in kind actions, so they do it in kind actions. So there's so many different ways to do it. But when you give your all in doing it, and God comes and helps you, and then you feel that he's really flowing through you in most unexpected ways. Yeah, that's right. But I think it's true for any type of, of metaphysical connection. I, I, yeah. Rabbi, does, doesn't like the stuff play a role? Like, you know, like Esther came to her house to drop off the kids and she's like, can you make sure you watch what they eat and what they see? And I think like that plays a huge role. Too. Right. Like your environment, like, you right. know, what do you eat? What right. Do you put in yourself. What do you see? Right. What do you hear? Right. What do That's you right. Say? That's right. Very good. I think the, those five senses. The divine. Yeah. Order. Oh, yeah. divine, in that divine realm, I think. That's right. That creates the structure for it. And then you create the content for it. But you have to have a structure with with you know with strict limits and definitions. It's it's what the Baal Shem of the founder of the Hasidic movement would say. That's how you would explain that verse in the Tauronomy that says that you judges and police you should put it in all the gates of your cities. That's the verse in the Torah. The literal commandment is indeed, we have to have a judicial system and we have to have a police force to enforce that judicial system. But the Baal Shem Tov takes it in a deeper way, not excluding, of course, the simple trans the simple directive, but he goes deeper and he says that in all of our gates, in all of our senses, we too should have judges mm -hmm. and policemen. We should know what to watch, what to see. Our eyes play a huge factor. There's some things that we should just close our eyes for or some things in which we use our eyes just to look at the positivity, not the negativity. What we say, what we hear, what we touch, every single one of our senses needs judges and police. So that indeed creates that structure for us then to become conduits because if the gates are stormed by all sorts of negative forces, then no matter how positive you are trying to be, that negativity can, can get to you. Yeah. It's like the famous story of Rabbi Levi Tzchak Berdichev, which I may have shared or not. If I did, please stop me. But um, it's one of my favorites in which uh, he was asked by a, a student of his, how do you exercise the art of self-control? And he said to him, I can't tell you, but I go to my student in this, in this village. He goes to the student in this, in this village. He knocks on the door. He sees him through the window, but the guy doesn't open the door. Remember that story? And he knocks on the door again. He knocks on the door again after like the 20th time. The guy finally opens the door. He says, well, I've been outside now in the freezing cold waiting for you to open the door. I knocked 20 times. What's wrong with you? And the man tells him, well, I just wanted to teach you the art of self-control. 
because here you have many doors everywhere and things can be knocking on those doors remember you're the owner of this house you can decide when to open the door and when not if to open the door and if not you're the master of this house so we have to be masters we have to have judges and police but then we also have to have the content which is that alignment that we're speaking about in which we're completely devoted to asking the where question what can i do now to serve as hashem's agent so that's that's the ultimate way and then eventually you know there's there's levels like the lubavitcher rebbe who by the way today is the yard side of the of the previous lubavitcher rebbe and uh, this is the day in which rabbi schnitzel of blessed memory assumed the mantle of leadership of not just the chabad movement but of world jewry altogether and of the world altogether um, exactly 72 years ago. And I really believe that he is one of the most important Jewish figures of all times, if only because he took a despondent post-Holocaust generation who was either giving up altogether on Judaism to no fault of their own. I, mean, I, I can understand them. Or embracing a very diluted type of Judaism and he revived them with such passion and joy and commitment uh, by not only uh, being that embodiment of joy and passion, but also by spreading his students everywhere to the four corners of the world, which was unheard of at that time, and and spreading the light as much as, much as they could. So really, this day is an important day. Speaking of the Baba Trebbe, it must be mentioned. And he did that with such love and kindness. This morning I shared the story about how one of his students, one of his emissaries, um, his name is Rabbi Moshe Feller. He lives in Minnesota. And in the 60s, he read a piece in a science magazine that says that if, God forbid, someone faints, I don't know if this is true medically, you'll correct me if I'm wrong, but that's what science said in the 60s. If someone faints, one of the ways to awaken that person that is fainting is by shouting his name in his ears. You ever heard that before? I don't know if that's true then, but but that's what science said in the 60s. He shouts that person's name in his ears and that could awaken him. So he made an analogy between that and the spiritual fainting or even the emotional fainting that people might experience. The way to awaken those people is to shout their name, their real identity, to remind them who they are in their ears. That's how you awaken people from the spiritual fainting. So he wrote this article. He was all proud of himself. He sent it into the Lubavitcher Rebbe before he published it to see what the Rebbe thought about it. And the Rebbe made only one correction, just but a correction that says it all. He crossed out the word shout. And instead he wrote the word whisper. Whisper their names in their ears. That was the Rebbe. Yes. Our duty is indeed to attend to all of those people who are fainting out there, but with a, with the whisper of love, whisper of kindness. Can't shout. A lot of people shout, <laughs> but it doesn't help. When you whisper, that's when you wake, when you awaken that person, that's and that's also self control. That's right. That's about the other, not about you. Yeah. Anyway, so that was Rabbi Chanina Ben Dosa too, who felt that. God would flow through him in his prayers when he had no obstruction, right? So that's where we're up to. We can continue on page 135 unless there's other comments, disagreements. Please, Joyce. Yes. But it feels good. Who are in homeless and mm. whisper. Whisper right. uh, whatever story thing. Mm. And they were always good to be in the Right. Right. But you know, some of you know what I was just good that how it works. Mm. And it was very powerful to me sitting there. Right. Right. And it's very humbling. Because I don't have anything planned. Right. And just do it. And, right. And I think what you're saying is really right. And I think that's because, you know, like the children are going to sleep. 
you know, serving people from the Jewish church today so it can be with the yeah. the prayers that can be with the for any age. Oh, very good. That's beautiful. That's right. And going back to what we were saying, look, when we shout, it's more about me and my emotions. I shout sometimes when I'm angry, hang, angry. so it's about my anger. Or I shout when I am trying to make a point, so it's about my point. I, shouting doesn't include the other at all. Whispering includes the other because we say, we whisper and we say to ourselves, well, we don't want this person to be alarmed, so I'm whispering. We don't want this person to understand me the wrong way. So I'm whispering. So whispering is really about the other, not about the me. Yeah. No. Oh, good. Good, good, good. You see? We take these words and you put them to action immediately. Beautiful. Okay. All right. So let's continue. The most complete example of such a prayer. Page 135. The most complete example of such a prayer is found in the Sur of Rabbi Chia and his son. When Rabbi Chia recited the words of prayer, he causes the wind to blow. The wind blew. When he said he causes the rain to fall, rain fell. When Rabbi Chia said he brings the dead back to life, the entire world shook. Right. And maybe the bad dead came to life, back to life. When Rabbi Chia uh, recited these words of prayer, but again, because... They were such channels of God that it was really God speaking. God can't go against his own word. So if God says, let the dead come back to life, it's got to happen. Uh, the, by the way, just just, uh, just as a technical note here, uh, the order of the Amida prayer is this order. When we pray the Amida prayer, so the first blessing is Mashiva Ruach Murad Ageshem. And then, so Mashiva Ruach is, causes the wind to blow. Murad Ageshem, he causes the rain to fall. And then, the end of that blessing is Mechayam Itim. That's why he brings it in this order. But that's the power of those words. And this is also why the Talmud says quite emphatically that Tzadik Gozer Vakadosh Bochum Mechayam. That when the righteous person decrees something, then God has to follow suit. Even if it's against the original decree. So that's why, that explains why so many righteous have that power. But they give you a blessing for healing. The doctors might be saying, well, there's no way this person is going to heal. And all of a sudden, a miracle happens because a righteous person has that divine power. He's the conduit of the divine, and the divine can't go against himself. Yes, Mark? Right. 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 I mean, there are stories like that in the prophets. Elisha, who, who was, you know, the right-hand man of Elijah, the prophet, he revived the dead boy. Uh, Heskel, Ezekiel, he went to the valley of dry bones and he revived those dry bones. You know, uh, he, he, the, the Rabbi Steinzeltz. Right. That could be interpreted metaphorically. But then the Talmud comes and says uh, that um, uh, speaks about the lineage of people. And one of the people there, I think it was Rabbi Yuda, says, I'm a descendant of those people who are revived by Yechesko, of those dry bones. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, so we have examples like that in, in the prophets. Uh, but certainly metaphorically, it can be explained. Some people are dry. Like Robert Steins also would often say that there are two categories of people in this world. Mm -hmm. Those that are alive, full of, you know, life, of a divine mission that they want to fulfill at every moment. And those you can't really say they're alive. All you can say is that they're not dead. Mm -hmm. So they're alive <laughs> and not dead. So, yeah, so that me metaphor certainly refers to category number two of the people who are not dead. Or oh, it's like Mendel Futefas, one of the great Hasidic Jews. He once uh, wanted, to, he was a teacher. He suffered in the Gulag for many years. And then he moved to Israel and became a, a beloved teacher there. I had the privilege of meeting him multiple times. But he once took his students to a stream, uh, not too far from where he was teaching in Tel Aviv. And then he tells his students, look, look at this stream. And can you see the fish in the stream? 
And he's, they say to him, yes, we could see. He says, which fish are alive? So they say to him, well, this fish is alive. He says, look, I don't know if we can see which fish are alive and which fish are dead. Because there's a strong stream. Maybe some fish are dead and they're just being carried by the stream. But I can tell you for sure that the fish that are swimming against the stream, they're alive. <laughs> they're alive. <laughs> Sometimes... That's what we have to do, swim against this, the negative streams of this world. And then, and then you're alive. You're not just not dead. You're alive. But that's, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. So everything is saying. Um, right. King, right. King Solomon, who was the wisest of man, the Midrash says that he would give 3,000 metaphors and parables to every one of his teachings. <laughs> 3,000. And you're right. There's a power to parables, metaphors, stories. Yeah. Anyhow, so, so, okay, fine. So bringing the dead back to life can be metaphoric, but it certainly also was physical. Um, which evokes a different story by Rav Steins also. I don't know if it's a story worth that I can say or not. Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> because yes. this is a story that Peter Himmelman told me. Peter Himmelman is one of the great singer-songwriters. Mm -hmm. He's a son-in-law of Bob Dylan also. Mm -hmm. But he says, yeah, he says he's the, he, you know, he considers himself as a student of Rav Steins also. He fell in love with Rav Steins also in 1981. 19, in 1981, Robert Steinsatz was on a lecture tour here, and he went to California, and he was invited uh, to the synagogue to speak, and there was a rabbi who spoke before him, and the rabbi went on to say that really the yearning that we express in the prayer in which we want the third temple to be rebuilt is only a metaphor, because really the prayer is speaking about the temple of our hearts. That's the temple that we want to rebuild. Uh, which goes against, you know, everything that even Maimonides says and many other people say. And that was Robert Stowns' turn. <laughs> I don't know if to say this or not. I'm on Zoom here, so got to be careful. But there was Robert Stowns. Uh, Peter Himmelman published it. And he was a very forthright man. Robert Stowns knew exactly how to call a spade a spade, and he wasn't embarrassed about it at all. So he says, I love the words of the rabbi. Suddenly there's a metaphor there. Um, but I suspect, <laughs> I suspect whether the rabbi ever made love before or whether he just lives in a platonic level where love is also just a metaphor. Well, the construction of the third temple is God making love with the Jewish people, bringing that love that he has for us to the physical world as we would bring it to the physical world. So there's a metaphor there, but we got to make sure also bring down these teachings to the world. So just to go back to your point, metaphors are, are extremely important. That's why King Solomon will use 3,000, but then we have to bring them down. That's it. Then we have to bring them down. Exactly. Anyhow, so that's bring the dead back to life also. I just want to mention one more thing about Rabbi Chia. Um, Rabbi Chia lived, this is different than Rabbi Chia Mendoza. There's two rabbis here mentioned. But just to speak about Rabbi Chia himself, Rabbi Chia was one of the great sages who was not only known for his power of prayer, but he was also known for his tremendous scholarship that uh, to the point that uh, he would, you know, everyone would come and ask questions from him and he would be the authority really of his times that could decide this is right and this is wrong because of the scholarship that he had. Now, on the other hand, uh, this is also connected on a deeper level to what the, the Torah says or the Talmud says that Var Hashem zu halacha. The word of God must become halacha. And they said about Rabbi Chia that he epitomizes that word of God. But you can say that he epitomized that word of God not, be, not just because of his tremendous scholarship as the Talmud alludes to, but also because he was such a conduit. So what we knew that when he said something, it was God saying it, and therefore it could become reality. 
And in a way, that also explains why he had this power in prayer. Because again, he was that conduit, right? That mentioned the word of God. A word of God that can't be refuted by God himself because it's God's word. Anyhow, that was Rabbi Chia. So just an interesting take on this great man. Let's continue here. Middle of page 135. Unless, of course, there's other comments, questions, stories, disagreements, metaphors, parables. <laughs> okay. So when a person is connected, anyone? Please, Daniela. Right. And then they'll continue one more paragraph and then we'll. Right. This, this reminds me of another Hasidic story. One of the great Hasidic masters was a man named Rabbi Menachem Mendel Morgenstern, Kotzke Rebbe, who was known also to be a man of truth. He never hesitated to say things the way they were. Uh, very fiery in many, many ways. Just to share with you a thought from the Kotzke Rebbe from this week's portion. But in this week's portion, we read about the splitting of the Red Sea, and after the splitting of the Red Sea, what happens? The Jewish people continue on in their journey in the desert. And they reach a place in which uh, they felt that the waters were too bitter to drink. And they started complaining to God. We have no water to drink. We're going to die here in the desert. And then God tells Moses to take a stick and throw it into the water. And that sweetens the water. And then they're able to drink the water. But the verse that describes that they came to this place and they could not drink from the waters says... As follows, Alken, uh, sorry, they by Avobne Israel Marata Veloya Hluli Stot Maimi Mara Kimarim Hem. They came to this place and they could not drink water um, from this place because they were bitter. And the Kotzka Rebbe says as follows, we're reading this wrong. They could not drink water from this place because they were bitter. People think it's the waters were bitter. No. The people were bitter. When you when you bitter, when you are bitter, no matter how sweet the waters are, the waters will always taste bitter because you're bitter. Your reflection or the world is a reflection of you. If you're bitter, then the world will be bitter, including the waters of the world. If you're sweet, then the world will be sweet. But that's that's the Kotzka Rebbe, always finding a good rebuke to give. But uh, going back to the Kotzka Rebbe, he would pray in a very cal calm way, right? Basically, standing still, maybe shockling a little bit, as they say. Uh, which is, by the way, the way the Lubavitcher Rebbe prayed. As opposed to the first Lubavitcher Rebbe, Abba Shnel Zalman of Liadi, who authored the Tanya, when he would pray, he would pray like roll with somersaults on the floor and sweating and blood and in a complete state of ecstasy, losing himself. So they came once to the Kotzka Rebbe and said, look how you pray. You pray so calmly. Your cousin seems to pray in a much better way than you do. When he prays, he's all over the floor and he's in a complete state of ecstasy. And the Kotzka Rebbe responded very, very profoundly, very shrewdly. He said to him, yeah, what can you do? Lazy donkeys have to sweat more. <laughs> so he's a lazy donkey. He's got to sweat more. I'm not lazy. I'm, I'm, I'm connected. Mm -hmm. And therefore, when you connect it to the source, you don't have to sweat that much. You have to try and grab it because you're there already. That's why in, in, the, in the prayer words, just before the Shema and the morning prayers, we speak about two types of angels. There's one type that's called the, the Ofanim, one type of angels, and the holy, holy animals, that's how they're called. They make a lot of noise, Begash Gadol, when they pray. The Seraphim are actually very quiet when they pray. You know why? Because the Ofanim are on a very low level. 
when you're on a low level, you feel separated, and therefore you shout, God, 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 God. When you're in a high level, seraphim, and you're one with God, you don't have to shout. God is right there with you. It comes flowingly. And in a way, that's what that's just to go back. That's what Rabbi Steinsaltz is speaking about here. That he has no need to work at aligning himself with the words of prayer, this righteous person, with external framework, with noise, because it's not external to him. It's one with him. And I think that's true in every matter of life. People make a lot of noise. It's people it's because they just feel disconnected. So they have to prove to the world that they are connected and therefore they make a lot of noise, right? People who are one with whatever it is. Michael Jordan doesn't need to make a lot of noise that he was the best basketball player of all times. Tom Brady, who just retired today, doesn't need to make a big, the big noise because he knows that. He's one with the source. People who say, hey, look at my talent. Look at this. Oh, yes, your scouts should be looking at me. Oh, that's because compared to Tom Brady, you're completely disconnected. That's the way it is in life. The more calm you are, the less... You know, everywhere you are, the more in tune you are. It's just a reflection of how in tune aligned you are.